All right. Thank you for recording, Brian. Welcome. All right, I am very happy to introduce Dr. Nick Bowman today. Nick got his PhD from Michigan State University. He is an associate professor at the SI Newhouse School of Public Communication at Syracuse University. His research considers the cognitive, emotional, physical, and social demands of video games and other interactive digital media. He has published more than 150 peer-reviewed manuscripts, huge, I'm exhausted thinking about it, and has <laughs> co-written or edited eight books on media psych and related topics. He's the current editor of Journal of Media Psych, He's a former Fulbright scholar and has faculty appointments in Canada, Mexico, and Taiwan. And I don't know why he didn't mention this, but he and I are both from Arnold Mo, which is super <laughs> swing. <laughs> and without further ado, uh, welcome, Nick. So excited that you're here. Thank you. And thank you for having me. Um, I appreciate this. It's actually, I, I've followed uh, your, pro I mean, your career and your program for a very long time. And it's been cool over the years working with you and even getting to know some of your students at the Fielding Graduate. And I'm excited about this one because I'm not going to present a study. I, I'm going to take a gamble and present an idea and, and a trajectory of work. And I'm going to do a classic academic thing where I'm going to end with a lot more questions than answers. So uh, I'll try to make the case for why we should be studying nostalgia a little bit more. Something that definitely has roots in psychology. But oddly enough, it doesn't cross over to media very well. It's a little surprising how much it, it doesn't quite cross over into media. And I'll talk about some of that in the context of video games. So let me show my screen here and I'll get us started. And actually what I'll do, let me first uh, do, start my slideshow and then I'll show this. Okay, one moment. I'll spare us all the jokes so that we could know this stuff and then we don't know this stuff. All right. Fantastic. Need one more thing. I'm going to swap which side of the screen is actually being shared. All right. So you should all see me now. You'll probably see some subtitles in the below that are not particularly accurate, but they are better than nothing, trying to do my best to be a bit more inclusive and accessible. So I'm going to talk a bit about nostalgia in video games today. Um, a project that, a concept area that I've been working in for a couple of years now, um, probably I'd say three or four. Um, I have to be up front and very much say that this came out of me search. This, this came out of me not really thinking that it was that relevant to study my own leisure and financial habits, but realizing that lots of other people are engaging with brand new technologies. I have a PlayStation 5 sitting in the corner over there, and we're playing 40-year-old video games. And we're using the cutting edge, you know, cutting edge technologies to go recycle old content, right? And I didn't know other people were really studying this until I started meeting some colleagues of mine. Uh, Tim Wolf, name will come up a lot today, and Johannes Breuer, uh, and a couple others. And then eventually I got to know some of the psychologists studying nostalgia who were digging into these things. So I'm trying to make a case for why we should be studying nostalgia in games. So first things first, normally I would have asked you how old the average gamer is. I feel like this audience would probably have a better answer. But if you go and ask, you know, uh, uh, parents, family members, the general public, they'll tend to say 16, 18, 15, 14. They'll give you a somewhat stereotypical answer where it's usually a young boy. They won't often say it, but it's usually white and they're playing in their basement. You know, Karen and I are from St. Louis. It's like the, the Midwestern thing. You turn 16, your parents lock you in the basement and you live down there until you graduate high school. And then you you go move on with life. Um, and I, in fact, had a video game console in the basement. And from 16 to 18, I played it downstairs, watched wrestling, went outside, right? But the average gamer is 32. And that number has been sort of creeping upward, where the average gamer is in their 30s, where 60% of gamers are over the age of 18. 
Um, gamers play about 12 hours a week. The gender split is not what we presume it to be. Um, if you go with the binary definition of gender, it's about 50-50. And about 76% of games are intergenerational. It's that 32-year-old or that 30- or 40-year-old who grew up with games playing games with their family. And this doesn't sound like it's all that interesting until we realize the medium is both quite old, but also quite young, especially in context of the other types of things that we study when we study media psychology, right? So if you were to put video games on a timeline, you could argue all the way back to 1961 being the first games. Um, Space War developed at MIT. It was basically a way for computer engineers to try to figure out the, the, the maximum capacities of the PDP-1 server. We didn't really have computer programs that we interacted with um, by screen. We didn't really have an expectation that you would type things in and get immediate responses. And of course, video games in some ways are the bleeding edge of that, right? Because you are engaging in a real time human computer dialogue with this machine. Um, 77, the Atari rolls out. Um, I'm born in 81. By 83, we've got the NES. The average gamer is 33. The Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis come out in the 90s. The PlayStation, where you started having the, the pistol grip controller, where you hold it kind of like this, comes out in 94. And nearly all of my students are born, and they are born in this century. So when we talk about our experiences, what we start to realize really fast is that this medium that tends to be seen as the kids' medium is the less serious medium. Or when it is serious, it has to be intentionally serious, right? There has to be some effort to make it more. We're not talking about the same thing. <laughs> and in fact, I go downstairs uh, where I would normally have this call, and I've got a collection of about 600 cartridges or tapes. And when I'll say that, the first thing my students will say is, what do you mean cartridge? And then I have to roll back and explain, well, it's like a... It's a program, you stuck in the console, then you activate the console. There was no DLC, there was no digital content. And in fact, even though I have that digital content, I still keep my stuff upstairs, right? There's a gap here. There's a huge gap here. But that gap doesn't make me sad. That gap makes me happy. That gap starts to remind us that we've got a couple of decades of history here. And if you look at the evolution of media, what you tend to see is a surprisingly natural progression to where as media evolve, they sort of look back on themselves and practice. So original content becomes interesting again. Um, many of you today probably recognize Mario. And of course that franchise has been through at least eight iterations, going all the way back to, I think, mid nineties, uh, 93 for the first one. Which admittedly, when it came out, it was kind of a weird game. Like, what do you mean it's Mario, but with cars? Yeah, that's fine. We'll, we'll try this. I remember it was split screen and it was 3D and you could throw turtle shells. And this was a really big deal. And if you wanted to solve fights as kids, you would use Mario Kart. It was a useful tool. Um, and it, it iterated over the years. And every time a new console came out with Nintendo, they stuck with Mario Kart. And they made the Mario Kart 64 and the Super Circuit and Double Dash, which I'm not a big fan of. And then I start getting cranky at this point and going, ah, DS, that's gimmicky. And then Wii and then Mario Kart, and then we have it today. And maybe some of you actually have the Mario Kart where it's an actual RC car with a camera in the front. And it's an AR race around your living room where you go out and plot the track. And if you have pets, this is the most fun game you'll ever play. And you can play intergenerationally and interspecies. But we start reviving the familiar. Um, we also start working on recycling old contents. We start looking at scenarios in which we're trying to dig up and understand um, what the old content might have been like. So if anybody here has a Nintendo Switch, I actually conveniently did not plan this, but I have mine, mine right here. And I can, I can fire it up, I can hop online, and I can play Nintendo's back catalog. I can't play all of their back catalog. 
I can play a fair amount of their back catalog. Oh, I just turned the comments off. Awesome. Keep them coming. This will, this will make it this will make it even more fun. But I can dive in and play like what now is on screen. If you're a video game hipster, this is when you go, actually, the first Mario wasn't even Super Mario. It was just Mario Brothers. And you're not wrong. Like, this is the original Mario. Um, I think we tend to view it through rose-colored glasses, although I'm still really good at it, and I still like playing it. It's probably in my gaming catalog recently on here, right? So, but we do see people asking, what was it like? What was the old stuff? Sort of like how my dad sat me down when I was 13 and introduced me to, like, um, you know, hair bands. He's like, all right, so it's time. Like, we're going to go downstairs in the basement. I'm going to get out my vinyl, and I'm going to walk you through 72 to 82. Like, this is what we're going to do. This is what we're here for, right? We also see the recycling of the actual content in terms of its re-release. I love that you said Rat Poison because the very first concert I went to in college was Rat in 1999. I just got to throw that one out there. Yeah, um, awesome. <laughs> it was it was at the uh, Pops Nightclub in East St. Louis. <laughs> the media revolves, and then Nintendo does this kind of crazy thing in 2018 where they re-release a Nintendo. And this is a tweet that went out on in June of 2018 and outsold the PlayStation 4 that month. And if folks remember, it was actually under manufactured. It was really hard to find these. Um, what you're seeing on screen, that's actually the shelf from my desk at my office. Um, I have all, I, I am a sucker for these mini systems. I've got them all wired into an HDMI switcher that goes into my desktop. And then if I need a couple of the days off, I um, I do this at the office. Um, but this starts to respect this idea that the past isn't just in people's minds, but there's some cultural, financial incentive to to, to bring it back. Admittedly, on Nintendo's old terms, you, you, some of you might be aware that 89% of games can't be played anymore. Just the technology disappeared, it was never preserved, and it's gone. And so it's a major problem. And there's a lot of discussions in emulator communities, which I won't talk about today. But regardless, when it mainstreams, it becomes accessible to everybody on somewhat equal footing. I've been using this word nostalgia a lot, and I recognize that we're a group of psychologists and we should know these terms, but I want to make sure we're sharing the definition. So nostalgia is the predominantly positive, social, and past-oriented emotion. We generally feel good about nostalgia. We generally think about it in the context of others, because a lot of times the people we were with help form that nostalgia trace. And of course, it's it's backwards looking. It tends to be bittersweet and that we're excited for the memory and we appreciate and even kind of revel in that old experience. But the bitterness is we can't go back to it. Um, Karen will recognize this photo more than anybody else, probably. This is the old St. Louis Square in downtown St. Louis. It was like the glamorous, glitzy mall in the center of the city. And it was glass. They had a Chick-fil-A like in the 90s when there wasn't one anywhere else in Missouri. Oh, and yeah. this dome was super pretty. And like our family didn't have any money, but we drive up there and walk around the mall and just like, wow, like the city's so cool. Well, it's still there. That's the glass dome they still have. And it's a big parking garage. Oh, so man. when I go back and drive through this, I'm like, <laughs> this is... This is underwhelming compared to what it used to be. But I remember as a kid walking under that dome and like feeling like you're somebody. Like you almost felt important walking through this fancy. At least I did and we did. Mm -hmm. Nostalgia is a sensory experience. It's absolutely triggered through the, the, these uh, touch and taste and sight and smell and scent. Right? And I bet right now already people are thinking about that dish from their childhood that smell of the outdoors, maybe if it, I'm thinking about myself. Um, you can imagine without much solicitation, those sensory experiences that are bygone. Um, I don't know if anybody here has ever traveled to Japan before, but the Japanese tourism board actually curates senses. 
they have a thing called the hundred tastes of Japan and the hundred smells of Japan. And what they've tried to do is find a way to capture the past and encourage tourists to basically leave Tokyo, like go do something else. Uh, I'm forgetting the name of the town I went to, but one of them is a candy town that makes beet candy because that was the only source of sugar post-World War II. Now that candy is not very good, but it's very nostalgic if you live in Japan in the 50s, right? And that beetroot sugar candy had this own unique quality to it. You know, for me, Karen, you'll appreciate this, is toaster ravioli because people in New York don't put meat in them. And so therefore they are not toaster raviolis. I don't know what they are. But it's just some weird cheese and some weird dough and it's missing all the ingredients that make it a toaster ravioli. I'll leave that one alone. Nostalgia is also relatively pan-cultural. Um, we see it across environments. We see it across, I mean, admittedly, a lot of our research is still very weird. It's very Western and educated and industrialized and rich and democratic, but we do see nostalgia in lots of different cultural uh, uh, um, spaces. I said it was social earlier. We tend to see nostalgia tied to another person. So the sense or the object or the referent might get you thinking about the memory, but as you unpack the memory very quickly, we see over and over again, it's connected to a person. Um, and that short-term recollection of nostalgia, we do have some evidence suggesting it does serve as a short-term analgesic. It, it does have short-term psychological well-being benefits. I, I would never suggest that like, don't go to the doctor, just play Mario. That's a little crazy, but it is the case that you could take eight bits after a long day. Um, I'm loving Stephen's comment here. And in fact, Stephen, I have a CRT down in my basement for this very reason. Um, so that I could still play old games and they still work just fine. And when I fire mine up, the first thing I think of is my brother and probably punching him or him punching me. But, you know, I think of that. There's two kinds of nostalgia. There is something along the lines of what we commonly talk about nostalgia. We probably mean personal nostalgia. We probably mean our own idiosyncratic self-referent uh, experience. I got to sit in Bush Stadium 2 and watch the 2011 Cardinals win the World Series. My father has smiled three times in the history of Earth and his time on it. And two of them were during this game. The third one was like when my brother graduated. Not me. Mine was more like, oh, God, thank God. Like, whoo, got him out. Right? And I have these memories. And it's a deep family memory. And I don't want to admit how much money I spent on this. I was a junior faculty, early career scholar at West Virginia. Hopped on a plane, flew home. If you watch this World Series, the Cardinals actually won game six to get into game seven. So you had to buy the tickets like overnight. My department chair covered for me because I just skipped all of my responsibilities. And I will tell you to this day, I still get goosebumps thinking about sitting in the stadium, watching the Cardinals win the World Series, and going out with a half million people on the streets and actually seeing downtown full for a night. It was a very important thing. My dad, even for Christmas that year, he made video of the winning pitch and then took still frames and stylized them and gave them to us as gifts. Like it was the neatest, most touching thing in the family. Our family only talks about sports, apparently, but that was it. Historical nostalgia are ide idealizations of the past that was not yours. The 1926 St. Louis Cardinals were the first of 11 St. Louis Cardinals teams to win the World Series, making them the second most successful franchise in Major League Baseball history. I will often refer to us as we. We have won 11 World Series. Right. We I've done it. I was part of it. You adopt this sense of indulgence of even identity connected to the past. If you were to watch my Amazon Prime, my movie account, you would I have the media diet of my late grandfather. I watched 50s and 60s Westerns. I watched Perry Mason. I I just love the dialogue of Golden Hollywood. Even though I teach diversity and inclusion classes on pop culture and use these films as horrible examples all the time. And yet, like, that's all I watch. I'm crushed. The TCM might be going off the air soon. That's all I watch. So 
It's not my history, although you can make an argument through media that it's become my history, but it's it's a bygone era. Okay. Personal and, and historic are going to be really important for this presentation. So if we talk about games, gaming nostalgia, I'm going to argue, and I think it needs more data and more of a robust, explicated argument, but it's a little unique because I can go back to the past. If I go back to the St. Louis Center, it is literally a parking lot. If I go back to my parents' house, it's changed in the last years. Um, and we've all had the experience of you go home and then you you get there and you're like, I mean, Karen, the water tower is not even green anymore. It's some weird, obnoxious, regular color. It's not the old green or old water tower that all of us knew it from back in the day, right? Um, anybody know what this is on screen? I'm just curious. I don't know what it's called, but I do know what it is. It's got the wires and the solder. Yeah, yeah. It's it's Zelda. It's the got Zelda. Actually, I'm being snob. It's Hyrule. It's the oh, land yeah. of Zelda. This is my other hometown. From, I, which, from which version? The original, 85. Mm -hmm. I spent so much time in this in this world. It is a hometown for me. And anybody who played Zelda did the same thing that I did. You came home from the store and you bought the game. And I still have physical media, believe it or not. You got the package and you ripped open the box. You threw it away. You didn't save the book. You threw it away. And then because of that, you didn't know where you were going. And you had to learn this map. And a lot of us even took hand notes. I would literally draw I asked my parents for graph paper so I could draw the maps and video games. I love it. People are talking about their hometown experiences. Yeah, we know this idea that, like, you didn't just spend a couple minutes in here, a couple of hours in here. It could have been tens or dozens or perhaps even a hundred. Remember, Zelda, when you beat it, just said, cool, do it again. Um, Now you're silver. <laughs> Go do it again. Everything's harder and you're silver. And then you do it again. Um, and if you played this map, like some of you who played this probably even have affective reactions to spaces on screen. Another area of my research I won't talk about today is called sense of place. And it's the idiosyncratic uh, connection we form with physical locations. And one of my, my, my central theses in recent research is that that same experience takes place in digital locations. And we have some data to support that. This is a hometown and it is relatively unchanged. I mean, if you have like your original equipment, the environment in which you are playing it has changed. The TV, the, the person has changed, but you get to go home. And home is like same crappy pixel universe it was 40 years ago. Same glitches, same weird stuff, same low fidelity. There's some comfort in that. And I think it's, I think we're too quick to dismiss nostalgia as a money grab or as some kind of uh, laziness. No, there, there's a psychological comfort in going home and getting to actually go home because we don't get to do that very often. Games have a touch and look and sound to them and frankly, a taste and smell as well. Anybody who's ever blown out a cartridge and like gotten a face full of dust or mold or anybody, who, yeah, I mean, they have all five senses. Stephen was talking about some of this earlier. But certainly there is the controller. A lot of my work in the past has looked at mental models for controllers and people get very attached to that mapping scheme. Um, if anybody here plays PlayStation and then your friend will invite you over to play Xbox, it's like handing me a dinner plate. I don't know how to use the controller. It's so totally different. Or how many of you have to rent a car and it's like the most anxiety provoking thing? because it's raining outside and you're like, I know cars have a mechanism by which to get rid of the water, but I don't I just keep pushing buttons and turning on the hazard lights or popping the fuel tank or dropping the convertible roof or something like this. I'm not even playing the sound for this clip and I'm gonna guess a lot of folks are already humming or hearing or even probably remember the, uh, the, the song playing in the background. And the boom, 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 ding, you can hear it. I think Stephen was saying earlier, you could hear the 
you know, the Zelda music in the back of his head just by looking at the slides, right? So we see these things. And this is the actual game. I haven't even talked about the paratexts. Posters, books, animation, cartoons, t-shirts. Anybody here shop at Target recently? Because your entire, your entire child is for sale. $12.99 a t-shirt. Apparently every kid in Target went and saw Pearl Jam live. I swear. <laughs> they got the concert t-shirt. They went to the show. They, they all they all bought X-Men number one by Jim Lee. I'm like, you didn't though. It was 91. <laughs> also, I'll take three shirts, please. <laughs> right. So connecting it to gaming nostalgia, these are quotes that I've lifted from some of my uh, participants. Um, published research, of course. Um my dad died when I was 10. And so playing Mario Kart with him was one of my best memories. This is great personal nostalgia. They're, they're playing this old game. They're thinking about nostalgic games. And they're remembering their own reference. Versus, yeah, my dad was the basic teen. He would go to the arcade with his buddies for hours playing games. I love that this participant mentalized and thought of what? their parents were doing when they were kids and had this like constructed model of a basic teen. And when I read this, I could not have felt more seen because I would literally get dumped off at Crestwood Mall with a roll of quarters and my parents would come see me later. Um, and if I remember the original arcade was behind a Sears, which is like perfect because they would go buy appliances <laughs> and they would disappear off and play Star Wars. I probably wore these jeans, that shirt, that hat. <laughs> and if this guy were half Taiwanese, half Italian, it would be me sitting right there in that chair. Except we didn't have nearly that nice of an environment to hang out in. But I love this idea that they were actually thinking about someone else's media history. And it's not really being unlocked in a lot of research. We haven't done much to follow up on this finding. So some early findings, because I want to get to Q&A, of course. Um, one of our first studies, it's published in PPM. We had asked people to walk up. We, we do, I do a lot of work where I will do online experimental designs. where We will design a survey study, but we will randomly order the prompts and then put people in two-by-two two conditions or things like this to try to see if different prompts, different reference, different memories will actually result in variance in the questions themselves. And all these are online. At the very end, I'm going to give you a QR code you can scan, and you can have all the papers from the presentation. When people thought about the past, they were more nostalgic than when they thought about the present. That is not a Nobel Prize winning study. When they thought about others, they were only nostalgic when thinking about others sparked this self-determined sense of relatedness. So there was, an, there was an indirect effect here as they thought about others. So when people thought about the past and had others, direct for past, indirect for others. And then oddly, this finding we've never followed up on. Competence had an independent prediction on nostalgia. If I just thought I was good at something, I felt more nostalgic for it. There's something interesting there because it's like construal theory, right? And how much we actually think we're good at things versus us telling ourselves we are of this environment or something like this. And nostalgia did have admittedly small effect sizes on vitality, connectedness, and optimism in the present. And these are small effect sizes, but all we asked you to do was think about the past. <laughs> think about a video game and write about it. And then the idea was the writing about that experience would help you access it. Why didn't we do a live experiment? It's surprisingly hard to get these technologies and then have people actually go back and play them because so many of them are gone. This is one finding. In the open-ended data, we did some thematic analyses of people's when we get asked the prompt to think about these gaming experiences. We found, for example, that in the nostalgic conditions, the, the, the main effect, Enjoyment was mentioned 40% of the time. Like a big anchor in their story was how much fun this thing was. Which, sure, nostalgia is typically rec recalling things you liked. But it was only mentioned 16% of the time for recent games. I'm actually surprised it was mentioned so low. 
challenge was mentioned 35% of the time for the nostalgic games and only 5% for the recent. I think what we're seeing here is that older video games placed a premium on mechanics, on, on the solving the game. Narrative elements weren't as strong. We just didn't have the sophistication of the technology. We didn't have the writers. We didn't quite have the language of gaming. You got to remember, go back and think about films in the, in the 1880s. There were horses running, trains moving, and we went, hey, it's moving. <laughs> 10 out of 10 for graphics, 0 out of 10 for narrative. Moybridge is a terrible storyteller, but he's great at filming horses, right? <laughs> um, childhood was mentioned more, of course. And if you know this game, you get a million bonus points that you can't use because I'm not on the faculty, but <laughs> this is my personal favorite game. Okay? What is there it? Was a uh, Contra. Oh, okay. Nintendo. The storyline is completely irrelevant. You just went from left to right and shot the bad guys. But it was inspired by the Iron Contra affair, except it involved aliens. <laughs> and when I was like five, I didn't care about this. But now I'm like, huh, that was actually kind of political. And they're like, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> um, there was a game called World of Warcraft still around. It's very popular. It's a massively multiplayer online game tens of millions of players. It's actually been out for 20 plus years now. There has been a persistently existing online universe that has existed for 20 years. And the game had been around so long that the developers thought it would be neat to re-release an original version called WoW Classic or WoW Vanilla. They rolled back the game, took out all the updates, went old school, for anybody on here who's a wild player, you might remember this. They even left some of the glitches in the game because that was actually part of the gaming experience. And so my colleague, Jess Robinson, and I wanted to look at nostalgia. And a lot of folks said, yeah, I wanted to go back and finish what I started. I never got to finish it. And the game evolved. Remember, your hometown changes. They gave you your hometown back, untouched. Here you go. Right? You know, um... They found something familiar in that town. And of course, that social presence aspect as well. This one's in games and culture. I think it's open access. We were looking at controllers to see if these would influence nostalgia. Um, the idea being that maybe playing a game with older, unfamiliar controllers would affect nostalgia, uh, would, would trigger it to be higher. Whereas playing with a modern controller that you're familiar with, might actually suppress nostalgia a little bit because it completes that mental model for how you understand experiences. Didn't work with Mario Brothers. Turns out Mario is kind of nostalgic inducing by itself. In fact, compared to a control condition where folks just watched the live play, everyone felt super nostalgic. We tried it with another game where the controller actually matters a little more. I'm going to skip for time. Didn't find it. But what we did find, I think, is even cooler. This is also a PPM. Found really neat effect among teenagers, uh, high school, uh, college students, but like younger college students. So this is a Johnson Neyman distribution. Uh, I'll, I'll kind of keep it short. What you're seeing on the x-axis is how much they said they appreciated the experience. It's your standard Likert scale. So the middle is neutral. Everything down here is negative. Everything up here is positive. When people who identified as gamers felt as if the game offered some non-neutral level of appreciation, they started to feel historical nostalgia. And I think what's going on here, as for the gamers in the sample, everybody in the sample was a zero time. They had never played this game before. They took it up not as a video game, as a history lesson. They played Double Dragon 2 like I watched Perry Mason or MASH or anything with James Cagney. Mm -hmm. Wow, this is old Hollywood. Wow, this is old television. Not as a way to deride it, but it was they were extracting this historical nostalgia like, wow, I get to like actually touch this old medium that i that this this bygone never part of my life medium and the language they used kind of played this out 
They talked about gaming history. They talked about retro games. They specifically focused on challenge. Okay. They talked about thinking about important people in their lives and how they probably played these games in the past. I love that movie, Alexandra, by the way. <laughs> I thought of the past because I was born after this or playing this game made me feel like I was born in the wrong era. So we don't have a lot of research and a lot of the writing on nostalgia tends to problematize it because there are problems with nostalgia and politics, for example, and social constructions of nostalgia. But I think we've just not, even as a, a field in media psychology, we haven't always had a, a positive disposition towards games. Uh, and in fact, games research has been played with a lot of infighting, right? And we're, we're starting to see the field grow and the players grow and the medium grow all at the same time. And we have some of these, I would argue, like these aren't that sophisticated of questions. It's just that no one's asking. No one's a strong one. Very few people are asking them. But I'll tell you when I do the research, I'm surprised how much this hits with people. Um, I gave a version of this talk at a game con. And it was cool to see 80, 100, 120 people it was families and their kids. It was parents and their kids kind of, I think, feeling a bit vindicated. So I want to leave time for Q&A, but I want to give a couple of like, where could all of this be going? Okay. So one area is we have a resurgence in games that are retro games that borrow styles of old games, but they themselves are original intellectual property. I've not seen anybody study how these are consumed. Do modern players actually see these as retro, as part of gaming history, as an homage of sorts? And if so, does that lead to some of the analgesic properties of nostalgia? Or is it just seen as like a quirky style? Kind of like how indie music somehow has to do with how it sounds. Because like when I was a rebel, indie music just meant, screw the man, I'm not signing a label with you. Indie music was any music not paid for by the industry. But if you go to a record store, there'll be an indie section. Right now in video games, there'll be a retro section. And the retro section is not old games. And maybe I'm just shaking my fist at clouds right now. But I'm like, that's a retro game. That came out last year. <laughs> this game is made by a studio in Guadalajara uh, called Halbert Studios. I do some work with them. They're a neat, neat bunch. And if you're trying to find a fun game, this game is really fun. But it's fun to me because I know the mechanics and the mechanics remind me of old games. In fact, when I interviewed these guys, what they would say is the most complaints they get from players are complaints about the mechanics. And they think what's going on is maybe the players, the younger players don't have the mechanical understanding of these games because they didn't play them. In fact, some of you on the phone might remember text games where you would type in what you want to do. Go to desk, open window. I actually think, by the way, that's going to be the next retro game. They're already making a comeback. The text-based mystery game. My favorite was the, the uh, Laurel Bow series is mine. Same argument here for time. Um, I'll ask students, like, how would you defeat these bosses? And a lot of students who don't have a lot of experience with games will kind of look at me like I'm crazy. And then the ones who do will go, it's the red dot. Red dot, red dot, red dot, red dot, red dot, red dot. It could be that there are mental models and expectations that retro games had that we have to make sure that we could tap into, or this could be the recognition of the style we don't have. Think of a movie like Pillow Talk, which was that sophisticated rom-com. That, that's a genre we don't have much of anymore. I just published a book chapter recently on The Mandalorian as an homage to Westerns, of the Western TV show, because we don't have many of them anymore. How might families share their gaming history? This is a Reddit post shared with permission where a kid found his dad's save file in Zelda Ocarina of Time. And of course, his dad named himself Booby because that's what we did. <laughs> if you go to any arcade in the Midwest, the number one player at the arcade is ASS because you got three letters for the arcade machine. And damn it, that was funny. That was funny. Um, ASS, there should be a documentary on this person because they were the greatest arcade player of all. <laughs> but I, what is it like? Like most of us, your save file was 
personal. That's not something you just let your brother have. Um, so to let somebody else crack open your avatar and pick up where you left off, that is a weirdly intimate thing that I have seen no research on. Um, I'm seeing some of the stuff here that I'm loving in the chat, by the way. Uh, second to last slide, what are we nostalgic for? So we know that the history of gaming is remarkably white. I'm talking 90% white men. And this was in 2009 on the left side, and 2019 on the right side. It got better to 80%. And if you compare these numbers to like the Hollywood Diversity Report, the GLAD reports, gaming historically has not done well with whose histories are on screen. If you look really closely, all of these guys share a demographic in common, and the little dude on the screen is the same person. <laughs> My dog wants food, and she gets 20 minutes, and you be quiet. <laughs> so we can think about, like, the shared stories and what was missing and what wasn't missing. So I want to leave time for questions. So I'm going to leave this slide up. And the first thing I'll say is if you do have questions, I'm happy to follow up. Um, this QR code will take you to some of these papers that, that, that the research is based on, a copy of the presentation and some other materials. Um, my email address is there. I have Twitter on here, but I actually don't use Twitter anymore. I won't close it down, but I'm a little tired of, uh, uh, of the CEO of Twitter. So uh, I'm mostly on Blue Sky. So if you go to Twitter, it will redirect you to Blue Sky. <laughs> um, so with that, that's my prepared commentary. And I'm happy to field questions, comments, notes, and just thank you all for giving me a chance to chat a little bit. And I hope that there may have been some threads of interestingness where this research, I think, has a wide open ceiling. So thank you. Oh, yeah, please. So um, there are so many uh, thoughts that this presentation touched off, but I'll, I'll go to a specific set. So I've done some stuff with media, trying to make the point that it media use can increase well-being. Mm -hmm. So I was interested when um, you said that in, in the one study you were going over, you said that you measured vitality, connectedness, and optimism. I was thinking about what those things feel like to me and thinking that they have to be related to a sense of well-being. If you're optimistic, you feel vital, mm -hmm. you feel connected to people. Um, and sometimes it just struck me that sometimes I could ask people like, tell me about your well-being. Like, do you feel okay? Are you sure. healthy? <laughs> but um, maybe another way of going about it is to ask them if they feel optimistic and vital. But but I also want to just say, um, can you tell us about vitality and the measurement of vitality? I don't think I've ever used that one. Yeah. So this came from Tim's lab. Uh, first and foremost, a major limitation here is a lot of self because we're, we're doing online surveys. We're coming up with relatively quick, you know, three items to crack these things open. Um, vitality often has to do with this sense that you have vim and vigor energy that you that you're activated if that makes any sense um and it comes from the subjective well-being research mm -hmm. um so you're you're dead on in that respect in fact when we did our we did a, we did a piece with the uh, current opinion in psychology on nostalgia and gaming and we were very careful to call it subjective well-being because it really was just people saying oh i feel full of energy oh, I feel like the people around me, you know, I have some kind of affiliation with them. Um, those are some of the items. Um, and the paper, it's in the link. I actually share the specific scale. And our lab does engage in open science practices. So for all of these, there should be an OSF link that will actually take you to the scale that was used in the research. Right. Um, but yeah, vitality tends to be like an energized state. Um, it is the It comes from resource depletion literature. People who are the opposite of vitality is like after that long day where you're just, you're tapped, you're exhausted, you cannot motivate yourself towards any particular goal. I know that state very well, but uh, I will say that this, uh, this presentation made me feel vitality. I think it's just looking at like pictures of Mario Kart and thinking about Bowser versus <laughs> the Donkey Kong and stuff. It's like, ooh, I feel happy to be alive. <laughs> yeah, uh, Brian, please. Very interesting presentation. Uh, uh, thank you. I'm, I'm wondering, Nick, to what extent are are your uh, is the research um, 
specific to video games as opposed to gaming in general. Like when I see a cribbage board, I get very nostalgic about my father because, you know, that's what we used to do. We used to play cribbage together. Um, and, and some of the same concepts like challenge, uh, I think, apply, especially, if, you know, if you have trouble counting to 31 like I do. <laughs> um, yeah, I love the question. And it brings up some interesting notes of explication. So to this point in the research, we'd actually been kind of careful not to argue that there is a unique nostalgia to games. But of course, as I say that, the idea of the hometown, well, that breaks it a little bit because it would be a medium that does actually give you a location to step into. If I were to spend more time, and maybe it's time for us as a field to think about this, Maybe there is a difference between the nostalgia attached to activities with an end goal, like, like games, where there is a rule set, there's a skill set, and there's a win state. I suspect you could articulate a unique form of nostalgia that comes from activities with goals and win states, which would include games, right? I'm not sure I've seen that article before, as I say it out loud, and I feel like you could make a competent argument that it's not so much that the nostalgia is different, but there is a different trigger or a different pathway towards nostalgia that could be uniquely interesting. Um, it, it, it's a weird open question, but I've actually never thought of this before, that we probably could make, A, an argument for games-based nostalgia that plays into the social dynamics of gaming, the win states, the skills involved, as you said, which may not be all that different than other types of games. And then I suspect within that nested argument, there could be one about the digital turn, about the digital turn being the thing that actually preserves it all. But Brian, like I imagined, for example, it's not just any card deck. If you happen to have that card deck, like it would matter. Uh, my father, when he moved from Taiwan, one of the only things he took with him was a Mahjong set. And I'll tell you, like when he pulls that out, it's kind of cool to be like, wow, that's that's the game, right? So the answer, I think, is yes, and I don't think we've tried to explicate it before. It, you might also uh, see a different, uh, maybe a lesser pattern of uh, racial differences oh, by, sure. by broadening um, the definition of, of game. I think you're right. And I think you would also be able to, if, if, if somebody really wanted to go down that path, find that one of the reasons nostalgia is pan-cultural is because you just swap in different games for different groups and you end up finding the same end goal, which starts making that argument very interesting in terms of a returning to those experiences. That's it. Thank you for that. I'm uh, scribbling notes on my graph paper sitting next to the computer. <laughs> Thank you for that. Pop into the chat to make thanks. sure I did not miss anything. Yeah, please. Well, I was going to say thanks for thanks for a fantastic talk, and I was so fascinated by the idea of nostalgia for a past that someone wasn't a part of. I had just never, you know, thought of that before. Um, and then I, you know, was thinking, of, of course, that's a thing. I mean, you know, we certainly see in political discourse uh, nostalgia yeah. for a past. You know, um, and then, but I was thinking even with you know myself. I remember when Mad Men was on TV and people my age you know, became sort of, I think, nostalgic for at least the aesthetics of that era, perhaps oh, not sure. the, you know, gender or racial politics. And, um, you know, um, yeah, I was just curious um, if you had researched that a bit more. And because that was, I thought, just a, a fascinating take on the idea of nostalgia that I hadn't thought about. Yeah, so it's one that um, I don't think most of us do. And when we do think about it, it's in sociology and it's usually in critique of politics, exactly as you said. It's that it's that um, make blank great again, which essentially means it was once and we can return you there and we can scrub out the parts that weren't actually great, which was most of it, and then get you back in that experience, right? And that is also a pan-cultural thing. I think we we generally recognize that. For, in fact, you could even get into the discussions of the label of a conservative, for example, often is pulled onto this experience. And so nostalgia is not just a, a morality play or, or or a twist of phrase it's no no i'm literally telling you like this is what we want like why are you changing this and 
that's not a critique per se. It's just, a, I think, part and parcel of the definition. Um, what came interesting here is we didn't expect that. We really did not expect much of this historical thing. In fact, in the original papers, we didn't even measure it. We weren't interested in it. And it wasn't until we did the really the study that just came out recently with PPM where we had found that 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 Johnson Amon effect, where we found oh, effect that uh, that interaction effect, right? Where we found that those those younger players were taking it up as a is a good old days argument, but it wasn't a critique. It was a celebration of something they hadn't touched before, and it was a suggestion that like there is something old here. And I think what made it interesting is, like you said, with other types of media, this is quite common. We have film history classes. We have art history classes. We have literature courses. We don't have gaming history courses yet because we don't think about the medium in that way. And when we think about the nostalgic games market, we typically think of people like me who are at the market picking through the, through the stacks. And I'll tell you, just as an, this is somewhat personal, right? But as I've been in the weeds, been at those flea markets, been at those swap meets, you don't typically see a lot of younger people, but you're seeing it more recently. Um, you're starting to see a shift, like the retro game con here at Syracuse every year does very well. Um, it is an oddly split audience. It's not just like me and people like me buying our children back or history back. It's the family comes along. All that's to say, that's where we're going with the research now. I think it explains why these products are not niche. And maybe that's a point. We label nostalgia as niche because it's convenient. But in games, talk about a medium that remixes its own past. I mean, one of the best-selling games last year was another Zelda game. Right? Like, we remix the past all the time. If anybody here is a sports fan... Um, remixing logos, remixing jerseys. Like nostalgia plays a heavy role in walking in that stadium. When you go into Bush Stadium, the first thing you see is a scoreboard from the last one. And then stand usual, right? And you see these things. And I think Patrick in gaming now, it's we wrote it off as economically and culturally uninteresting. Part of that is some of the toxicity among gaming cultures. And now we're seeing it's actually kind of mundane except for the people it's not mundane for. And that's that younger gamer. So kind of a long answer. All that's to say that that's, I think, where a seam of research could go is how these newer gamers are actually the ones that are culturally, economically, and socially rationalizing and making legitimate buy stuff. And, and that's the part that makes it interesting. Yeah, great. Thanks. There, there's an article, I can't remember who's the author now, but they write about, um, they asked their college students what the 50s were like, mm. and they, they found that they based it on like Marion Cunningham and stuff from Happy Days because they weren't there. So they have to like figure out, like we could look for Mad Men for the 60s. Yes. And my son, actually, Jason, he works at a retro gaming store and he loves all the retro gaming stuff. He has tons of cartridges and all these different systems. But um he also has like a bunch of songs from my iPod from day back in the day. And he'll like introduce me to them. But it, he would say he loves the 80s. I'm like, you were not there. <laughs> but um, but it's, it's like Perry Mason is also one of my go tos. And I, and I was not there. But you could say some of that is false because, yeah, I hate all the women things in Perry Mason. It drives me nuts and I have to yell at the screen. But there's parts of it that are real that I love, like. I cannot tell you how much I love that they just have like pencils and paper and there is no phone yeah. there. There's no possibility of having that. I just feel like if I could go back there, I would be in love with that whole situation of, I love technology, but it's also overwhelming and it leads to lots of trouble. You know, so on that note about technology progress, I think another thing that makes this interesting is it's actually providing us markers of progress. And I mean, from technological capabilities. Um, so one thing we saw, and again, Patrick, we didn't really follow up with this. We really should. It's um, I moved universities after the research and we're resetting again. But um, it provides them a marker of what it was. So when you go play that text game, all of a sudden, the new Final Fantasy VII Rebirth looks very different. When you go play that piece of product over here and then you shift it over here, right? Um, they're getting an appreciation for these genres styles at the time 
um, which I think is an important part of the psychological experience of media consumption, because now you're not just consuming what's in front of you. You're actually trusting a lot more than that. You're, you're bringing more to the equation when you sit down in front of it. Um, Atari, y'all might know, is kind of like back and popular again. They re-released the 2600 last year. It can the, the machine that came out last year can play Atari cartridges from the 80s. Hmm. It, it's unbelievable. Um, I had an interview with their CEO, uh, or with their president, rather, and their legal team about maybe trying to do some research. And it's not going very well, but they had this idea that they're like, they want to know the, the phenomenology, the experience. And I was blown away that they were coming to us. They were like, we know how to market it. Like, we got that. We know, like, stick an Atari label on something and it says retro. But we don't quite know what that experience is beyond that. And one of the things you talked about, Patrick, was that don't assume your younger players are out of your age because you might be surprised how much of they're actually driving this. Anybody here shop at uh, Urban Outfitters, they are going to start reselling iPods, iPods mm -hmm. that they're being refurbished. Um, a little me died, <laughs> um, but I saw it. But I was like, wow, I just saw a technology die and come back. <laughs> so there's a lot to unpack here, I, I think, more than anything. Uh, Brian, please, yeah. Sure. I was also wondering, that, you know, what, what is the, the specific role of of engagement, you know, in, in the sense that, you know, with, with any form of gaming, whether it's video or not, you're actually mm -hmm. engaging in it. I, on, on Sunday, I went to a, a really large um, car show in my town in Arizona. And that was just a, that, that was a, a nostalgia fest. Sure. I mean, people walking around, my, my dad had one of those, my grandfather had one of those. So, you know, some of them are restored to specs. Some of them are perfectly restored on the outside, but have completely new, you know, insides. Mm -hmm. uh, but you're not interacting with any of it. Right. You're, At the end of the day, you're touching it's little... any of it. Yeah. That's a great um, one. At first, I have to respect that I, uh, my other car is a 64 Spitfire that is pretty on the outside and occasionally runs. But that is also what they did in 64. So it's really, it's right. just the same car. Um, this is something that I want to explore further because the question I have and the way that I would frame that, Brian, is what's neat about, if I go watch an old James Cagney film, I'm not going to lose. I'm going to sit down, I'm going to grab a drink, I'm going to grab some popcorn, and I'm going to have a complete uninterrupted experience. There is no way you can guarantee a video game. And I have often wondered about where is the, and two questions, one is, at what point does the nostalgia wear off and it just becomes a video game? And I don't think we know that point. I don't think we've investigated it close enough. And the second one is, what is the interaction of nostalgia and losing? Um, because part of this is there is some comfort in old mechanisms and old controllers. But after a couple minutes, like, okay, I'm objectively bad at this. And I'm as bad at this now as I was. I can tell you, again, using anecdote from like the Reddit community, the collector community, a lot of folks, that a common post is that, man, I thought I thought I was nostalgic for dot, dot, dot. And what they'll talk about, Brian, is I pop it in my Nintendo and I fired it up. What a terrible game. This was awful. There's latency, there's lag, there's clip. I couldn't perform anything. And I think what they're saying is that there's this other force, and that's that interactivity force, that is disrupting their ability to just enjoy this referent project. Some of that could be of all the experience later. So I guess on the one hand, interactivity probably enhances nostalgia. Because again, I'm not just going home, I'm walking around high school. I'm actually going to navigate the experience and all the arguments around immersivity would play a role there. On the flip side, now you've got a situation where I want to be nostalgic, but every time I push that button, nothing happens. Every time I push this button, something else happens or this goes bad. Um, and as you saw in the one data point, when people thought they were good 
it was enough to increase nostalgia. Well, that also means the opposite is probably true. If they think they are bad, it suppresses nostalgia. So short answer is interactivity has to matter. It's probably another one of those delimiters that helps us understand the uniqueness of a digital form, or like you said, a gaming just interactive form. And related to that, performance probably plays a big role. I love Andrea's point that, yeah, Fable's a great game, and take the controller up. And you're like, and to that point, oh, man, I, I, I promise I'll stop. I just did an interview with the Daily Beast, and they were talking about how these online games have gotten awful. So what folks do to protect nostalgia, Brian, is they watch YouTube videos of the old games. Mm -hmm. Because that way, they can still get it, but they don't have the labor, the demand, and the disappointment that comes with actually pushing the buttons. There's a lot to unpack there, and we haven't done it yet. Yeah, I, uh, I've had that experience where I remember being awesome in grad school and I play with my kids and I can't use the controller and they have to yeah. show me how and I think what happened. But then also there's developmental stuff like uh, my boyfriend used to love the movie Top Gun and we watched it like 40 times. And then like when I was 35, I watched it again and I thought, what fresh hell is this? It's like a terrible movie. But at 14, it was the best thing ever. So it's and that plays into the social bit. So that's an even another one where sometimes and maybe as a final note, sometimes it's actually not the game we're nostalgic for. It's the vehicle to be nostalgic for a person. Mm -hmm. And that's another one I want to explore. Um that one I'm finding I'll, I've been when we go back and read through the data again and recode and read, we're starting to see that potential link to where the game is not so this is probably for folks who don't see themselves as gamers. The game isn't the relevant thing, but it's the gateway to what you just said, the person I did it with. So if the person isn't there, they they log out pretty fast. And I don't have the same developmental needs. I remember taking my kids to right. Percy Jackson and the lightning thingy thing. And I'm like, if I were 14, this would be amazing. But <laughs> right. it's written for me, you know? So you have to be like, you have to come to it ready for who sure. it's written for. Yeah. Sure. Well, Nick, this it was incredibly awesome. I don't want to cut anyone off if you have other questions or comments. No, thanks for having me. And, and especially folks, you know, I, I feel bad. I haven't been able to spend as much time with some folks as I, as I wanted to, but um, stay in touch. I mean, um, you know, you've got the, uh, all the, I gave the slides to Karen and Karen and Brian, share those freely. I have no qualms about that. That last QR code will take folks to the slides, to papers, to other things. Those data sets are all open. So feel free to take a peek at them. If you have ideas, I will say again that this area doesn't have a whole lot of folks researching in it right now. And I've been surprised at the, I would almost call it fervor. Like people are really interested in hearing about this work because I think we're hearing about ourselves and we're hearing about a medium that we just didn't take that seriously. And now people are saying, hey, it's okay to be 46 and want to go play Final Fantasy III again. It's fine. Like, in fact, secretly, we all do the same thing. So thank you for hosting me more than anything. I, I really appreciate it. If you don't mind, I'll, I'll make one more comment about something you yeah. said. You said something about um, these designs are not that sophisticated. Well, I think sometimes, this is not the only distinction, but sometimes simple ideas are really meaningful and people don't do them because they think they need to have like an interaction that does various things. And so it's sort of a lot of esoteric things get done. And at the end of the day, it was very complex and flashy, but what does it tell us? And sometimes it's the simple ideas that are deep so and if you're not the um the big like my mentor was such like you have to have a three-way interaction or blah 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 but um i i love these things that have a depth of meaning and they don't have to be complicated they're simple because they're interesting and universal so i would just say that to encourage anyone myself included doing research who um you, you don't have to make it all fancy necessarily is it does it matter like does it have resonance Thank you for that. This, this was, thank you for saying that, by the way, because I think we do lose track of that as we develop better tools. I mean, there's a reason we still need T-tests at the end of the day, right? Right. Well, this was great fun. I had many, many trips down Nostalgia Lane. Thank you for those different St. Louis thank things. You. Awesome. Stay in touch, folks. Please reach out. Um, thank you for this. All right. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Alexandria, I'm going to reply to you elsewhere. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>